In the 5th century, the Roman Empire abandoned Britain. As soon as Rome withdrew, the island's inhabitants of over a million Celts and Romans had found themselves on the brink of a dramatic upheaval. From the east, the forebearers of today's English left their homeland of northern Germany and surged across the island. Meanwhile, their Germanic kinsmen to the south had brought the Western Roman Empire to its knees, establishing vast kingdoms in the heart of the once mighty Respublica. While the Proto-English and the Germanic tribes that settled Rome shared similar origins, their fates diverged starkly. In modern France, Italy, and Spain, the new Germanic elite quickly embraced the sophisticated cultures they overran, casting aside their ancestral ways and completely assimilating into the local Roman culture. However, in Britain, the Anglo-Saxons clung fiercely to their old customs and ways of life. By the 7th century, the new emerging English culture had completely supplanted that of the original Celtic inhabitants. It seemed as though that Britain's native population had completely vanished from what is now England. This dramatic transformation poses a thrilling mystery. What exactly happened to the original Celtic and Roman inhabitants of England? Did 5th century Britain witness history's very first case of ethnic genocide? The year is 410 AD. Four centuries of Roman control over the British Isles has come to an end. Many of the few remaining imperial forces on the island have long since departed for the continent several years ago. Serving under the self-proclaimed Emperor Constantine III, the Roman garrisons in Britannia became embroiled in a complex power struggle upon the mainland. Many of these soldiers would never return to set foot on the island again. Constantine III, a former low-born soldier who rose to prominence, has been declared emperor by his troops in 407. Within a year, he has successfully expanded his influence, securing control over nearly half of the Western Roman Empire. However, by 411 AD, a series of strategic missteps led to his eventual entrapment in all, where he found himself besieged by one of the many generals who were loyal to the legitimate emperor Honorius. Ultimately, Constantine III surrendered the stronghold when offered clemency, only to have his head displayed on a pike on the very walls he recently guarded. His fate had marked the end of a series of usurpers crowned on the island. Barely holding any semblance of order within his own continental provinces, Honorius refused to send forces to a now defenseless Britain. The island is left to its own devices. Despite nearly four centuries of imperial control, Britain had remained the least Romanized Western province. Roman culture and the Latin language had left their mark, especially in the south. However, much of the Celtic pre-Roman political structure and culture had endured through the centuries of Roman rule. By the early 400s, vast hordes of Germanic peoples had swept throughout the empire's western provinces. Most of these Germanic people used to serve within the Roman army as auxiliaries, famously known as Fodorata. The wavering loyalty of these Germanic soldiers made them extremely dangerous. Nevertheless, Drained from the dozens of civil wars, Rome had no option but to rely on these foreigners. Eventually, most of these Germanic mercenaries would carve their own states within the provinces of the empire. 
Britain would be no exception. The people of Germania, who now flooded the Western Roman Empire, were familiar with the island. Auxiliaries from beyond the Rhine had served in Britain since the early Imperial Age. Meanwhile, the Saxons had been raiding the southeastern shores of the provinces for centuries. It didn't take long before the power vacuum started to be filled by waves of invaders who quickly established themselves in Kent and East Anglia. The first wave of many Germanic migrations to come. The intricate web of trade and commerce, fueled by constant shipments of manufactured goods in the empire, was now replaced by people seeking refuge or plunder. Londinian went from being a regional epicenter with baths and roads to a Blackwater hamlet relying on the barter system. Descending from northern Germany and the neck of the Danish peninsula, the Angles and Saxons settled in Hampshire, parts of East Anglia, and Northumbria in the 5th century with intense clashes against the native Britons. The change of the guard didn't occur overnight, but eventually the Celts were driven away from their homes and pushed westward. Simultaneously, Pictish and Irish pirates added to the chaos by sweeping into the land, wreaking havoc on their Celtic cousins. Despite being cornered and facing daunting odds, the Britons displayed remarkable resilience. While ceding large portions of land to the advancing Anglo-Saxons in the east, the Britons managed to retain control over the north as well as west of the former Roman province. A coalition of Celtic kingdoms spanning modern-day Wales and northern England successfully defended against the Germanic peoples and even reclaimed lost territory. Despite these initial successes, the Anglo-Saxons gradually gained the upper hand, and by the 7th century, nearly two-thirds of Britain fell under their control. While the Britons of Wales continued their resistance until the 1200s, their counterparts in England seemed on the verge of disappearance by the 1600s. The intricate tapestry of Britain's early medieval history unfolded, shaped by the dynamic interactions between both the Germanic newcomers and the resilient native Britons. With a population likely nearing a million just before the Roman withdrawal, the Celtic inhabitants of what is now modern-day England faced a near extinction by the 8th century. Merely a century or two after the consolidation of the Anglo-Saxon conquests in Eastern Britain, the landscape had dramatically transformed. The new Anglo-Saxon rulers presided over an overwhelmingly Germanic-speaking and pagan population. It seemed as though the native Christian Celtic people had experienced a virtual extermination leaving scant traces of their culture and language for their Anglo-Saxon successors. Britain emerged as the sole former Roman province, where the invading Germanic culture did not only endure, but completely supplanted the heritage of the original inhabitants, marking a stark departure from the developments in mainland Europe. Five eleven A.D. Clovis, the inaugural king of the Germanic Franks, had, after carving a vast kingdom, embraced a transformative journey. Originally a pagan, Clovis converted to Christianity during his reign. Following his demise, Clovis found his final resting place in the Abbey of Saint Genevieve in Lutetia, present-day Paris a Christian monastery that he himself had commissioned in 502. 
This abbey stood as a tangible testament to the amalgamation of Frankish rule and Roman practices. The uniqueness of this scenario lies in the harmonious blending of cultures. Clovis not only adopted Christianity, but also embraced various local Roman customs during his reign. In return, his predominantly Gallo-Roman subjects accepted their new Frankish rulers with relatively little resistance. The Germanic Franks reciprocated by quickly adopting many of the local Latin cultural elements. The Roman legacy burned even brighter in the south. In Spain, the ruling Germanic Visigoths abandoned their native language, only decades after the fall of the Western Roman Empire. Meanwhile, in Italy, the reigning Ostrogoths not only preserved the Roman Senate, but also declared their loyalty to the emperor of the still intact eastern portion of the empire. The old Roman culture and traditions were still very much alive in continental Europe, a situation that was quite different in Britain. Unlike their counterparts on the continent, the Germanic settlers in eastern Britain did not adapt the local culture. Instead, they seem to have eradicated it. The question arises, what led to the extinction of the Romano-Celtic culture in England? Was it an ethnic genocide or forced assimilation? The answer to this question is nuanced, particularly given the scarcity of evidence from that era in Britain. In a simplified response, the differences between the Germanic conquests in mainland Europe and Britain can be attributed to the distinct nature of the conquered people, rather than the conquerors. The Franks and Visigoths ruled over regions with ancient literary traditions and solid Latin cultures. In contrast, the Anglo-Saxons found themselves in an area where Latin and Celtic cultures had mingled, but to a much lesser extent. The Britons' greater defense capability, ironically, had played a role in their downfall. Having preserved many pre-Roman military and political structures, the Celts of Britain effectively resisted the Germanic invasion. On the mainland, the native populations of Italy, Hispania, and to some extent, Gaul, had been demilitarized for centuries, leaving them little choice but to accept the new Germanic elite, without significant resistance. In contrast in Britain, a protracted struggle ensued between the natives and the newcomers, fostering noticeable hostility between the two groups. Consequently, upon conquest, the Germanic Anglo-Saxons relegated the locals to a secondary status. It's essential to clarify that radical extermination or severe discrimination as observed in modern times, did not take place in Britain. The Britons in England, outnumbering the Anglo-Saxons, gradually abandoned their culture over time and adopted that of their conquerors, an assimilation process likely influenced by other factors. On the mainland, the Germanic conquerors were familiar with the former success of Rome and drew legitimacy by claiming a relation to its legacy. This situation was markedly different in Britain. For various reasons, the Anglo-Saxons seemingly held the Celtic culture of Britain as inferior to their own. Despite likely constituting a minority in their new homeland, the Anglo-Saxons successfully imposed their culture and language on the natives. Although Britonic culture did not entirely vanish, it endured and flourished in the west of the island, ultimately giving rise to the medieval Wales, an intriguing chapter that deserves exploration 
in a future video. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this content, then please go ahead and subscribe to the channel, as well as giving us a thumbs up and clicking on the notification bell so that you never miss another historical moment from us. Thank you.